So I have two laser pointers. Let's see. Okay. So Daryl Baskin here. I'm a I'm a retina doctor in private practice. I used to be in the military, and um, I love giving talks. I haven't given one in a few years. So we'll see how this goes. I want it to be interactive. If you guys want to stop and ask questions, we could talk about something else. We don't even have to get through half the slides. There's a lot of slides we probably won't get through them. All right. So we're going to talk about fluorescence. And this is not a great intro for people starting out because it kind of presumes you know a lot. So I go, I have a few introductory slides that Ethan kind of talked about. And then uh, I don't have any relevant financial disclosures, that is the truth. So basic retinal anatomy, let's see. Let's switch. Oh, did I start the recording? I'm not sure. I, it says it's recording. Oh, nice. Yep, I got the three, two, one, you guys didn't see it. Okay. I think this is my retina, if I remember right. So uh, I put this together a long time ago. So if there's something wrong, please don't tell me. Um, so uh, let's see. Oh, the pointer doesn't really work on that surface. Oh, that's fine. So fovea is 1.5 millimeters on average. It's basically the same as the optic nerve, OK? And then uh, parafovea is a ringer right around that. I don't, we don't use these terms a lot in clinic, but they are in your book. It's useful to know. And then you've got the perifovea. And then right around that, you've got this near periphery. But essentially, we're looking at a retina, and we're looking at ways to de demarcate it. You know, city, state, country kind of stuff. That's how I tell my patients about it. And a foveal vascular zone is defined by the FA, of course. You could also define it by OCTA. Tons of variability. I used to say 400 microns. It's somewhere between 250 to 600 in a normal patient. And then when they have different diseases, that can enlarge that, like diabetic retinopathy. So. We can see the blood vessels in the retina, right? And I can't point at them. Let's see, does a blue pointer work at this screen? I'm just probably, that is really interesting. Okay. All right, so I'll point with this. Does this create like a laser pointer if I, nope, that didn't do it. All right, well, that's fine. We're good, so I'll just talk through it. So this is, does anybody know what this diagnosis is, by the way? This is not the point of the talk. So in the center, you see, go ahead. Exactly. So we've got an occlusion of a retinal artery, maybe a cilioretinal artery. There's also a lot of venous tortuosity. This is a complex picture. This prob I, I, have, I don't remember this patient very well. It's probably been 10 years. I think it's a cilioretinal artery occlusion, and you also have a, um, like a CRVO as well. So it's an unusual sort of scenario, but it, it's out there. So, that, so I have written here, boundary between the retinal and choroidal vasculature supply does vary. Typically, I tell people that, and we, but we don't really know. The, the retinal circulation, the retinal blood vessels supply about the inner two-thirds, and the choroid gets the outer one-third. But then if you read a lot, uh, you'll find out that the choroid probably supplies most of the oxygen necessary for all the retina. Um, it just depends on how much light is going on and that sort of thing. Okay, I don't really like this slide, but I felt, it, I felt obligated to kind of talk through some of the anatomy because this plays a big role in the fluorescein. We'll get to that in a moment. So the internal carotid artery, I cut off a lot of these other things. We're not going to go through all the labels. Gives off the ophthalmic artery, which you can see there. That gives off the central retinal artery. It actually start, it comes off earlier, very close to where the ophthalmic artery comes off of the internal carotid artery. And then we have a short posterior ciliary artery and then the long posterior ciliary artery. The short posterior ciliary artery supplies basically your, the choroid, the back of it, the post-equatorial. And then it also supplies your optic nerve head. And you can kind of see in this picture, which I can't point out with the, we're not really gonna use these laser pointers, um, that you can see this tiny little 16 to 20 little perforating blood vessels go right in there, supply that region. And so they obviously are coming in separately from the central retinal artery. And that's important because of the way the fluorescein works in the ICGA. We're gonna go into some basics on RPE. RPE is a support layer for the retina, super important layer. If the RPE is dead, the overlying photoreceptors are dead. So it's a monolayer, cuboidal, hexagonal pigmented cells, continuous with the pigment epithelial and ciliary body and iris. It's about 16 microns in diameter. <clears throat> it, they, your book will say a much lower number, but there's some recent evidence that suggests that each RPE cell, at least in the fovea, supports like 100 to 200 photoreceptors. So if you have one dead RPE cell, it's bad for a lot of photoreceptors. Um, and so compared with the peripheral RPE cells, foveal RPE cells are a little bit different. They're taller, thinner, more melanosomes, larger melanosomes. And there's a bunch of functions. I don't think these need to be memorized, but it's important to know. The RPE absorbs light. The phagocytosis rod and cone outer segments. 
and that plays a role in how autofluorescence works. It participates in retinol and uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid metabolism. It, it forms the outer blood ocular barrier with the zonulate occludentes, those little like, connections between the RPE cells. And then it maintains the subretinal space. It keeps it dry, if you want to think of it that way. It pumps fluid out. And it heals and forms scar tissue. So this is from Matt Caldwell, a uh, cadaveric specimen. If we zoom in a little bit, we get a little bit grainy, but I want to show you the choroid. So this is not exactly where the RPE is, but it's pretty close. So you have the RPE beneath that Brooks membrane. And then you have the choroid, which has three components to it, Haller's layer, Sattler layer, and Choriocapillaris. So that's only important because of this next part. The outer portion, which it starts in the Haller, you, know, you have this perforating, you know, short posterior ciliary arteries, feed into Haller layer that goes to Sattler, and then it goes to Choriocapillaris. And those first two are not fenestrated. They take up most of the volume. And the Choriocapillaris has these little windows, these little fenestrations, which fluorescein will be able to leak through. We'll talk about that in a moment. So there's tons of different imaging that we do. This isn't even all of it. And we call it multimodal imaging, and it is actually really awesome, but it's pretty overwhelming too. So we're only gonna kind of dissect into a little bit of it. The center one OCT is kind of my, you know, my love, my first love. I spent many hours, I, residents would make fun of me. They have like little pictures of me like just hanging out with a spectralis late at night, you know, looking at picture, <laughs> patients' pictures. I still do it, but from home now. So, yeah. um, so, so but we're gonna focus on mostly autofluorescence and that's only if we have time, but FA and ICGA. So fluorescence, I think everybody in this room knows what that means. I actually didn't know there's a difference between fluorescence and phosphorescence until a couple days ago. Phosphorescence, does anybody know what that is? Maybe, it's its own light, right? Sort of, well, it's, it's very similar principle. It's, you know, those little stars that people put on their ceilings. So that, that's a different chemical. It's obviously not fluorescein. And basically the light that goes in primes it. And, uh, and it's just like fluorescence, at least initially, you have this um, photon that's, that's absorbed, electron goes up in orbit, and then instead of it going to this, I didn't even know there was like a, a positive and a negative spin, so a singlet energy state in like S1, that then in fluorescence, for instance, it drops right back down. It loses a couple levels and it drops down emits a different photon, a longer wavelength because it's lower energy. But with phosphorescence, you actually have it kind of some weird thing where you have the electrons that go over to a, a negative negative or a positive positive state, call it triplet excited state. And then it's unstable, but it has a hard time coming back down and emitting a photon. So it's like a lower probability of emitting the photons, like a 1% or we'll say for instance. And so it leaks out photons more slowly. So that's why you can put those stars on. You can still see them an hour or two hours later or like the Legos that glow in the dark, you remember those? Same kind of idea, but, but in the eye, it's different. It's, we use sodium fluorescein, and that basically has a very short lifetime. So it comes right back down, and there's actually some really cool studies where they look at fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy, and they look at how long it stays up in this sort of absorbed, not yet uh, emitted phase. But so fluorescence is basically this principle that a ton of different elements do this, including sodium fluorescein, including ICGA, and they immediately come down, but they emit a different light than, is, than goes into them. So that's fluorescence in a nutshell. And if you look at fluorescein in particular, thank goodness I put some circles on here. So um, the ex there's a certain peak of excitation. So you send in a certain wavelength. In this case, it looks like, I don't know. Oh, it says right there, 498, which is like a bluish green. And that's the peak, but you could send in a different wavelength of light. You could even send in just bright white light. It's gonna absorb it, and then it's gonna emit a different color. And the way that we pick that up is we, I think of it like you have a flashlight shining in a specific wavelength, and then you have a camera that receives that reflection back. Now, if you just have a regular camera that's receiving all wavelengths, you're gonna get the blue and the green, and the, the green which is emitted, and the green is gonna be probably outweighed by all the blue reflectance. So we have basically an optical filter picture like some green saran wrap over the camera lens and then we only see stuff coming back in green so we don't see any of the stuff that initially went in we only see stuff that's emitted and that's basically the principle of fluorescence you have a specific color going in and you have a specific color coming out we're trying to measure what's coming out at that different wavelength so emission peak and there the book actually talks about this in more depth than i thought it would it ta the bcsc uh, talks about using a camera based or a flash based stimulus or excitation versus a laser like a, an SLO, a scanning uh, laser ophthalmoscope. 
And so you, you have, there's some pros and cons to both. I, I think I have one picture later on if we get to it just to kind of illustrate the differences. There's a lot of different ways you can do fluorescence, autofluorescence. And then ice, ice indocyanin in green just has a difference it's in the near infrared. It's the only FDA approved for medical use near infrared uh, fluorescence. So that's essentially a very similar concept. We're going to talk about ICG, the, the actual compound, later on. So now we're going to go, we're going to basically have three sections here if we get through the fluorescein, ICGA, and then autofluorescence. I didn't, you didn't mention autofluorescence, but I thought it's so close. We might no, as well no, that's fine. So here's a couple principles. Fluorescein dye binds to plasma proteins, and in this case, that quenches its fluorescence, but there's still about 20% that remains unbound and fluoresces, and it fluoresces in the visible spectrum. We talked about, I'm saying green, it's not maybe exactly green. And that's the compound. It's metabolized by the liver and the kidneys, eliminated in the urine for 24 to 36 hours. Always important before you order a test to talk to a patient about it. I wish I could say I do that every time, but I really do try. So I, I will let my patients know, hey, you're gonna have yellow, orangey urine for a day or two. Don't be surprised by that. That way they don't call you later. You know, you save yourself a call. The young patients tend to get nauseated. The older patients don't. Uh, it's not the end of the world. It goes away when it's done. And then you do get hives and things like that around 5% of the time. And then I haven't had this in a long time, but in the military, this seemed to happen all the time. Uh, you get an extravasation of the dye and it can be very painful and just put an ice pack on that, make sure they don't get necrosis. So uh, very rarely, and this did happen to my grandmother, which is part of the reason she didn't die. She, but she did go to the ICU. She had major hypotensive episode after during a fluorescein angiogram with her uh, doctor, I probably shouldn't say the name because if I put this up. So a retina, who's a great retina specialist who's still in practice in Houston. Anyway, but she's, she, she lived at that point. Uh, she was fine after that. But I, for me personally, I don't order as many FAs partly because of my grandma and what she went through. Uh, and I have a colleague who, when he was a fellow, he and the co-fellow were sued, uh, or his co-fellow sued actually, because uh, the patient died after an ICGA, and that's extremely rare. So bad things can happen. I always ask myself, is this medically necessary for something that has less than you know, minimal risk? So I'll mention that the book does say one in 222,000 risk of death. Uh, you should always be on the premises and if, if an FA is being done, and my practice is always keen on that, that don't go for lunch if we're doing an FA. Um, we haven't identified any teratogenic effects, but if I have a patient, in, uh, I don't have, it's usually a myopic C and V patient. Uh, and again, I do OCTA for that. We talked about that earlier rather than FA anyway. Um, and then it, fluorescein is transmitted to breast milk. So I don't do many FAs in pregnant, I don't have many pregnant women that come to my practice. Um, so it's something to think about. Okay, so I'm going to ask you guys a question. This is not the BCSC. So it's, sodium fluorescein is excreted in the kidneys, right? So can it lead to contrast-induced nephropathy? You can say yes, no, maybe. You can give me, like, and I will tell you, if you'd asked me this, well, like last week, I would have given you a different answer than now, and, and my answer was based on what I thought was pretty good evidence. Anybody, does anybody, has anybody known of a patient's gotten CIN from fluorescein angiography? Mm -hmm. I don't either. So I'm gonna say, most of you are gonna say probably not likely, right? So I used to tell people it couldn't happen if they asked, because uh, a nephrologist had looked into it after I'd asked mm -hmm. if I could do it, and, or he wanted to find out, and he said, nope, there's no, no report of cases. But there is a paper is like out of Korea where they found about a 7% risk, and they measured it based on CIAKI and CIN criteria anyway. So, so there is some risk, and, and in general, if a patient expresses concern about it, I just won't do it. You, if they don't make any urine, you can still give them a, you know, fluorescein, and you could still do an FA. I, typically, I'll reduce the amount of fluorescein. I don't talk about it in here, but we use a lower volume than normal anyway. Yes, you, first question of the day, go for it. Do you know if that 7% risk was in people who already had kidney disease, or is that just- They were diabetic patients. They were diabetic patients, and they did say, yeah, I actually thought about putting it in there. There's a U-shaped curve, depending on what stage they were at, that they had a higher, lower risk. Like, for whatever reason, like stage one had a little higher risk than stage two, um, when they were looking at um, different diseases, different levels of uh, disease, not disease activity, whatever whatever term they used for kidney failure. It's all diabetic nephropathy. This, all, this study was all diabetic retinopathy, and then in this case, uh, some, they, they ruled out a bunch, it was a retrospective analysis. So they, had, they took out a bunch of patients that they felt had another reason to have kidney injury from other medications they were on, and they did a pre-FA, and then they, if they had access to it, 
pre and post serum creatinine. And so it, it's, it wasn't a beautiful study, but it still illustrated there's probably some risk. And again, if a patient's really pushing back, I, I just don't do an FA. I mean, it's, there's very few times where I really need the FA to do what's right for the patient, like without like some really good hunch anyway. So lower doses and renal compromise or skipping the FA. Okay, so we're, here we're gonna talk, This I had to show an OCT. I just can't explain the retina without OCT now. I mean, it's, it's structural, it's very approachable. We all learn OCT now better than we ever did FA. In fact, I can take, I, if, if you had to give me a choice between looking at the patient and getting OCT, I'd almost always pick OCT for at least retinal conditions. That sounds awful, you probably shouldn't repeat that. <laughs> so, but, but here's the idea. So I'm gonna show you a few like simple rules. We talked about the choroidal circulation. We talked about it coming from the short posterior ciliary arteries. So you're, you're basically getting some fluorescein that kind of goes down the highway and then some of it goes off on one fork of the road, some goes on the other fork, and those go to two different parts of the eye most of the time. So this green highlighted part is the choroid, of course, and then that purple blue indigo line, that's RPE. So first rule is the choriocapillaris leaks fluorescein like a sieve. So you know, you've got those fenestrations, once the fluorescein gets to the choriocapillaris, it just spreads out, it's everywhere, okay? And, and you will see that in multiple disease states, you'll see that, and, you, and oftentimes that doesn't play a role in even some diseases, so that doesn't make sense, but we'll, I'll come back to that. So second rule is RPE acts like a curtain in two ways. One is the RPE has the zonulae occludentes, which is basically the outer blood retinal barrier. Fluorescein can't pass through there, so you don't have, unless there's a disease state, of course, like CSR. So you don't see fluorescein leaking through there. But you also, because of fluorescein's visibility, the emission spectrum, the visibility is like we said green-ish, that doesn't penetrate through the RPE. So the RPE blocks the visibility of that light coming out. And then we have the retinal vessels. And these retinal vessels don't leak. They shouldn't leak, right? So th that's the inner blood retinal barrier. That's the endothelial cells, the tight junctions, to keep the fluorescein inside. Okay, so this, gosh, no point. Oh, you can almost oh, yeah. see it. Oh, yeah, there, there it is. is. All right, if I hold it, if I shake it around, you can see it. Okay, so why is this so dark? All right, we're going to ask my question. Brandon. Uh, this blue definitely doesn't work on this. All right, well, you saw where I was pointing. Yeah. Why is that so dark? Yeah. Just give me an idea. Or, or, so that's the fat, the foveal vasculars. Right? right, so you're getting at, there's no retinal blood vessels there, right? Right. Any, and, okay, that's, that's awesome. Uh, that is definitely the main reason why it's so dark. There's two other reasons, though. The thinner gets the other. The, the, the retinal layers. The, the, they, it is thinner, but I don't know if that would explain why it's darker. Um, but there is some xanthophyll pigment there, and that does absorb a little bit because we're not seeing. This is out here. Oh, gosh. So you're, there's, there's got to be a way to put a pointer on here, right? I'm just going to mess it up. Okay. Oh, you saw the mouse? Yeah. Oh, you just gotta drag it from one to the other. Do you see it now? No. No. Do you see it on your screen? Yeah, I do. Yeah, move, it, move it to the side until you get the PD. Oh, 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 gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right, we've got a genius here. Okay, so right there. All right, so uh, right here we have this kind of, this would be like a normal sort of choroidal, uh, and this, I mean, there, there's some choroidal flush here. You can't see that super well. So the reason this is dark as you mentioned, there's no blood vessels from the retina. There's also xanthophyll pigment in the, fo in, the, in the photoreceptors, and actually, I'm not sure, so much sure, sure they're in the photoreceptors, they're just in, I think they're in the um, outer plexiform layer. Mm -hmm. And then you also have, um, you had the RPE that's actually a little bit thicker right there, so it's blocking a little bit more of the choroidal fluorescence. So, um, all right, so let's go to this. So we're gonna talk about timing. I would not memorize these timing seconds, I found there to be a lot of, I wouldn't say confusion, but lack of real specificity if you look at any other resource. I mean, even if you look at the BCSC now versus like 15 years ago. So in general though, I'd say that the time from what I call the arm to retina time is about 10 seconds, 10 to 12 seconds. So you put the dye in the arm vein, in the cubital fossa. If you put it down here in a small vessel, it's gonna take a little bit longer. So as it goes up to the eye, we'll say about 10 or 12 seconds. And then you have the arterial phase. It's maybe, in my mind, just a couple seconds after you start to see some choroidal filling. And it should be almost at the same time. And I'll show you a video of that in a second. 
Um, arteriovenous phase is when you see this laminar venous flow. I'll have a picture of that, and that's, again, just a couple seconds after the arterial phase. The venous phase completes the course. So if you see filling of an artery, like say the superior temporal arcade artery, you should see that corresponding vein filled up within five to 10 seconds. And then mid phase is basically a couple minutes after an injection. There's, it's, it's still somewhat bright and then it's pretty washed out by late phase. And you really don't have blood vessels that are lighting up at this point. You have kind of stroma, you have maybe the optic nerve and you kind of see almost like a negative of some of the blood vessels. So this is an FA and an ICGA side by side. I did that on purpose even though we haven't gotten an ICGA yet. So you could see the choroidal filling and you could also see the timing. And I'm, let's see if I can start it here. Okay, so I'm gonna pause it. This, so first of all, if you look at the timer, if you can see at the bottom, there's, it says 25.51 and there's 30 degrees, 25.54, that's the number of seconds. And, and so the first thing I do when I'm, there's a concern about timing, there wasn't in a central serious patient, is I'll go back to my photographer and say, to get the timing right. And they'll say something like, oh, we let the tourniquet on, so the timing's gonna be off, or oh, I started the timer too soon, it's gonna be, but I wanna know if they said, no, no, I, I, got a, you know, I got really good flow and I got the timer started on time, that's really important. And we'll see that in a few of these today. So let me pause it, let me go back a little bit. So, okay, on our left, uh, you could see that's the FA, on our right is the ICGA. And you could see that there's some dye going into the artery already. And you could see that there's some, on the ICG one, you could see some choroidal blood vessels, those kind of lacy little white things. So you could see that there's almost simultaneous filling of both the arteries and the choroid. So there's not always like a pre-arterial phase. And for timing purposes, this we'll call this normal timing, even though this is not a normal patient. I don't order FAs and ICGAs on normal patients. So here's a good example. But you can see it fills pretty fast. You know, we're at 32 seconds now. That's laminar venous. Let's pause that, whoops. And there we go. So let's see. Ah, there we go. See how it looks like a snake? You see kind of the white, black, white, the stripes on the vein, that's laminar venous. That's an important timing thing. No, I don't think I've ever seen a question on OCAPS about, you know, laminar venous, but that does help you know where you're at in terms of the timing. And then, you can kind of just get a sense, and it's a little bit darker than normal in the center due to um, subretinal fluid, but we'll come to that in a moment. Okay, here's just a few more timing things. Unfortunately, these all have pathology as well, so you'll see these circles highlighting some pathology. So you see the arteries filling. We have a little patchy choroidal filling. It's hard to see, but where that red circle is, this is a patient with ocular ischemic syndrome. This is a uh, this is laminar venous. You can see that really well with those supratemporal veins. And then this is a patient that had a, a CNV. She also had mutes. It was kind of a weird scenario. She, previous CNV, this is just a scar at this point. And then this is another patient with central serous. And this is what we call peak phase. You'll hear that term as well. It's maybe a minute, maybe 30 seconds to a minute after. It's when things are the brightest, when the periphobial, paraphobial capillaries are really visible. This is a very unusual case of um, acute idiopathic maculopathy. Um, and basically we have, uh, just ignore the center, we'll come back to something like that later, but you can see that it's still somewhat bright, you still see the blood vessels, the blood vessels are brighter than the stroma, and then, yeah, that's the OCT, and then this is that late phase where it's almost like we have a negative image of the blood vessels because if you see my little drawing on the OCT, the green is where there's still a little bit of some staining from the fluorescein, but the blood vessels are all empty, showing that there's no longer any dye in them. Okay. So the other way we break down fluorescein, this is the more important component, is too bright or too dark. We use the terms hyperfluorescent and hypofluorescent. Um, this didn't exist when I was a resident, but now we're using the term cyanescent. Have you guys heard that? So some people are like hypercyanescent, hyposyanescent. And I got to thinking about that. That's, we just made that word up. It's, there's, <laughs> it's not real. But then I thought autofluorescent isn't real either. It's just fluorescent or not fluorescent. But so I'm not going to have a pet peeve. I don't want to have a pet peeve about it. I think it's fine if you want to use cyanescent. It just sounds a little extra erudite or something. <laughs> so, but for here, these are hyperfluorescent. And we could break hyperfluorescence into kind of four categories. I think three categories is enough. Leaking is real. A window defect or transmission defect is real. Staining and pooling, it really depends on who you're talking to. And oftentimes, if you show them the same picture on a different day, they'll say staining one day, pooling the other. And for all intents and purposes, it does. it's not really going to change what you do. Staining and I'll show you a picture of stain before I go into it. And then hypofluorescence is two things. So you're the blocking 
some brightness below or you actually have a filling defect like you have a lack of blood flow. So here's a staining example. These are drusen. Staining basically does you have brightness somewhat early on. It can happen later too. Brightness in an area and then it maintains those boundaries pretty well and it's generally discussed that staining is thought to happen to uh, solid tissue. And then I've got another staining I think. Nope, got transmission defect next. We'll come to pulling in a moment. This is a very interesting case is the lady who had a spontaneous RPE rip and so she has a transmission defect. You can see temporal tumor fovea. There's this bright white gash. That's basically where the RPE got pulled back. And um, usually that only happens after like a shot or after you've had CNV or something like that in the context of macular degeneration. In this case, she's got an RPE rip. And now we can see the underlying fluorescence of the choroid. So it's like somebody opened the window and like, ooh, that's what the choroid looks like. So the RPE is no longer blocking. We talked about the RPE being a curtain. It's a really good example of when the curtain gets a rip in it. And then this is leaking. So leaking, this is, um, leaking basically means you have hyperfluorescence, so it's extra bright, and then over time it gets bigger and bigger, it expands. And we t we're not going to talk about classic CMVs, but a classic CMV would be one that's bright early and then over time gets larger and brighter. And so this patient also has a classic CMV due to macular degeneration. Okay, so, gosh, I hate not having a pointer. Uh, Anybody want to tell me what they see starting in the little red circle? Circling something bright. We're talking about hyperfluorescence. Here, I'll show you two more. And I already told you this is an example of leakage. So this is, this is like the, the quote-unquote classic presentation of central serous, the smokestack. So you don't see very often this other stuff going on, um, but that's an example of leakage as well. So this is my pooling example. Actually, it took me a long time to decide if this was going to be a good pooling example. I actually asked one of my old mentors, Bill Benson. He's like, oh, definitely pooling. So <laughs> this is what it looks like in OCT, which is the way I see the world. So you see a big pigment epithelial detachment, serous PED, patient was asymptomatic, and uh, got an FA, make sure, at the, you know, make sure there wasn't a, you know, some kind of exudative process going on. And you see it getting brighter over time. And really, this is not that much different than staining. Pooling is basically for fluid-filled spaces. Staining is for solid structures. The pooling will keep that, like you said, in um, staining, they'll keep their boundaries. And pooling Both of them. will also keep their yeah, boundaries. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Good point. And here's our filling defect. So you could see that a little bit of a paraphobial sort of ring of capillaries there, but then a large area where there's just no blood vessels. And that's the color there. And then this is a blocking defect. It's kind of hard to see. Once you see the color, it'll make sense. We're blocking choroidal fluorescence there with a patient with Coats disease and a lot of heart exudates. Okay, so here we go. Some cases. This is the fun part. All right. So, Brandon, all right. Alex, what do you see here? I'll sit down so I don't sound oh, so not so intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to describe like the Yeah, or just, or yeah, you could, uh, this one's not going to be a timing one, okay. you, but yeah, tell me. Just, well, I'm seeing really bright, um, like arterial space type of situation, uh -huh. I think, or laminar. I think. Well, so you're, you're right, you're blood, seeing bright blood vessels. Bright blood vessels. So we're, we've earlier. got arteries and veins both filled, and you're right, probably, I don't have the timing on here, 30 seconds to yeah. 60 seconds, like a so peak phase. Early in. And then I'm seeing like paraphobial. Yeah, I haven't given you multiple images, but you're right. It's like, probably that's what I'd be thinking of. so. I, and I would even make it simpler than that. You could say I'm seeing something that's brighter than normal, so hyperfluorescence. And you know, if you saw more, this might turn into a leaking mm -hmm. thing, but probably not based on that pattern. That's more of a, a there's just not many things that leaked starting out like that. So that's a staining pattern. And, and then any broad differential would you put this into, just like a category, not a diagnosis. Like kind of a circle around the fovea. Um, what's that one thing? Like a shooting arrow. Like a bullseye. So then we have a bullseye mac and I should put this on here, but I don't have a bullseye maculopathy list here, but there are a lot of different entities that fit into this, and we'll see a few of them today. So like uh, toxicity from certain drugs. Oh, like, um, 
Yeah, and I don't want you to have to answer anything else. But yeah, Plaquenil, like the things that a lot of my patients in the Hill Country are taking for their COVID, right? So uh, if we're allowed to say that, I don't even know if we are. I don't want to offend anybody. And I love my patients, so. But yeah, so Plaquenil, like a cone dystrophy, uh, gosh, a, a neuronal, oh gosh, what was it? Neuronal, steroid neuronal lipofusinosis or something like that. I'm not even saying it right. Neuronal, anybody want to help me? Steroid lipofusinosis, yeah. And then you've got like star guards, right? And this patient is ABCA4 positive. So I've got another patient that I saw the same year, also ABCA4 positive and look similar, probably a little bit later in the, in the FA, but what's really different? What's that? More central involvement. That's right, we got more central involvement, we got more staining, but look, look at how, uh, I don't wanna say the word, how the rest of the background looks. It's quenched. very dark, so exactly, it's quenched. So that this is more the typical star guards you read about. They have this dark choroid, but it's actually not as common as we used to say it was. Now that we could test everybody for star guards, we're finding out a lot more people have star guards than we thought. I don't think dark choroid's nearly as common as we used to think it was. All right, awesome, okay. And then we got Catherine. This is actually kind of a hard one. So I circled in green. This is 41 seconds into the floor scene. If you were to describe, so let's take a step back. It's better to learn how to describe photos with a color photo. So I'll start off, uh, and I don't want you guys to do this with, with these because we don't have time, but, um, but it would be useful in the future. So when I'm looking at a color photo, I'll just go through five kind of categories. I'll, I'll look comments on the media. It's a clear media, or it's vitritis, or it's hazy, or I see you know, membranes. Then I'll talk about the optic nerve, I'll talk about the blood vessels, the macula, and if I can see the periphery. And that way I kind of have the structural way to go through it, and that'll keep you from making pitfalls or missing things if you're at like a, you know, some kind of academic conference. So the way I would describe this is, you know, we've got, we've got an FA, it's on a spectralis, you don't have to say that, left eye, uh, we're 41 seconds in, so we're kind of in this arteriovenous phase. Or you could say even just early venous phase. Again, I hate all the timing terminology. If you look at it, it's not standardized. And then we see, you know, a fairly normal appearing optic nerve, blood vessels, normal tortuosity and caliber. And then we see these dark spots, right? So I circled one of them. There's a, there's like two or three others. And then here's the next one at three minutes. So it's starting out dark, and don't pay attention to the other ones. Now three minutes in, it's brighter. So there's a couple of things on the white dot syndrome list that are block early and stain late. Is this ringing a bell for anybody? So, the wreath is a little bit different. You're thinking of mute. So the, so the classic block early stain late is ampy. Uh, that's a good one just to tuck away in your brain. Blocks early, stains late. And this is a patient who had ampy, we thought initially, this is actually four months after her presentation, when she first came in at four months, I should have the photo up here to talk about it better. She just had a few dots in the center. We called it ampy, and then she came back, and she had more dots. And now it's more like a ampiginous, which is getting more into the uveitis kind of minutia. But you can have the or relentless placoid choriretinitis. So you can have these other conditions that the white dot syndromes are really funny. They they seldom fit the textbook profile. I they it seems like all the ones I ever see me they have something weird about their background. So so. I'll save Catherine, for, I'll save the next one for you, okay? So this one was not fair. This, yeah, that's fair enough. Um, okay, so this is not a question one, this is just a fun video. So if you could figure out what happened, uh, this is an FA I took, or I, I had done when I was back in the military. Okay, it's like a minute long, so we'll just kind of watch it. I'll talk you through it. So, okay, we see choroidal filling. Notice the pulsatile nature of the arterial filling. This is not normal. Okay, see that? And then even the laminar venous phase that we're watching, we're kind of like, almost like watching in slow motion, right? This is normal time. This is a, how much time it took to go. It's like filling, 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 but very slowly. Normally, arteries are filled within a second, veins are a couple seconds later, but this is taking longer. But it, there's, a, there's a little key as to what's going on here at the end of the video. We're still watching. Now we're kind of in that peak phase. We see, oh, something happened. And then there's something else. Uh-oh, what's going on now? Yep, and <laughs> anybody know what happened? Oh, vasovagaled, exactly, yeah. So they were, and that's what was going on. As they probably started vasovagaling when they got the injection. And exactly, their blood pressure dropped. Their eye pressure was high enough where the blood was having a hard time getting into the eye. 
<laughs> yeah, it's like a horror movie for ophthalmology. Yeah. So I love that video. I, you could almost identify the person, but not quite. So I think it's fit, safe. Um, and the patient was not harmed in the making of the video. They caught him or her before they fell down. But it illustrates what's going on when you have, you know, this, when we do injections into the eye, especially Sifovri, Dr. Diaz's favorite, okay. we're injecting a really high volume into the eye. And if you ever operate with a retina doctor and we have to push up the, uh, the pressure to 60, you'll see, you know, you'll see the pulsations. Or if I'm injecting PFO and there's not a good release, you'll see the optic nerve turn white. And this is basically a mismatch between blood pressure, eye pressure. And this will happen in your dialysis patients when you're doing injections. So I always warn my patients, hey, listen, and this is in my initial talk when I'm giving shots. This is all I do all the day, all, all day long, by the way. When you're in private practice, it's AMD and diabetic. <coughs> Excuse me. But I tell them if your blood pressure is low, you're gonna black you're gonna have a blackout. It's gonna or or white out, but usually blackout, and it's gonna last for a couple of minutes, and we just want them to stay in the chair. And when I'm actually numbing them up, I use a CTA now, a cotton tip applicator with the lidocaine soaked in lidocaine and I actually put extra pressure on the eye to sort of mas not massage it but to decrease the pressure kind of like we used to do with the Honam balloon for cataract surgery does that ring a bell for anybody in the old 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 days like before my days and we still did it during my day but we didn't need to anymore when you did cataract surgery you made these big wounds you always worried about pressure issues so they actually decreased the eye pressure pre-op by putting this big balloon right over their eyeball and strapping it around we would use weights when I lived in Africa and you basically are trying to detergest the vitreous, um, and that makes you makes the surgery a little bit safer, maybe less likely to get a choroidal hemorrhage. But when I'm doing a big shot like Sifovri, I'll spend even more time. Or if I have a patient with glaucoma that does has very poor uh, facility, they can't really adjust afterwards. Putting a little bit of extra pressure oops, onto the eye ahead of time will help. So that's what happens when you have a pressure mismatch. Okay, that was fun. All right, so. This one, okay, so we're 45 seconds in. All right, Catherine, this is you. Now we're 53 seconds in. If you see a time on these, it generally means it's important because it's a pain to get the times on these. And so we're 53 seconds in, and what do you see filling up right now? You got some, you're seeing the nerve, and then you see some arteries, right? Yeah. And we know from before, like there's not a lot of timing that's important, but I'd say by 10 seconds, 12 seconds, you should see something. And now we're at 53 and we'll assume the timing's right. So we've got a really, we got a big delay, right? Yeah. And I would argue that there's, it's too dark all around. Like there's no choroidal perfusion right now. So we're seeing dark, dark, dark. It's slowly getting bright. Now we're at a minute and now you see the choroid showing up. Here's my other rule, <clears throat> and this is not from a textbook, but if I could see the leading edge of dye multiple times on stills and the stills are usually two to three seconds apart then something's wrong because when you see arterial filling by the time the next still photo comes up it should already be done so if i see it multiple times if i can just kind of watch it moving as i'm scrolling through then there's a problem so now we know we have delayed arm to retina time now we have delayed arterial av transit time because we're not getting the veins filled up because now we're 110 and we still don't see venous flow no laminar venous flow so something's wrong, right? So we're, there's something going on where between the, the arm vein, we'll say the heart and the eyeball, we're not getting good blood flow. And I've got a couple more. You can see how long it's taking work. Whoops, I went back to the beginning. I did that earlier. Okay. Going, going, going. Okay, and now we're at a minute 54, laminar venous. Very slow. And you can see there's really not much capillary perfusion around the, the uh, fovea in the macula period, even this early. And now we see this, and we see a cherry red spot, or a, I don't know, that's like a tomato yellowish cherry. Uh, and, and we see all that opacification of the retina. Okay, this is, I'm gonna let medical students go for this. I don't have the diagnosis up yet. Do you guys know what this is? Cherry red spot, loss of transparency in the fovea, painless loss of vision, ringing a bell? It's okay if it's not. CRAO. Yep, CRAO. And I, I, I just called it a CRO at the time. This is when I was a fellow, but probably there was some component, maybe even a partial cilia, like a choroidal uh, infarction or even an ophthalmic artery problem. Okay, now we're on to the next case. So yeah, so very bad. We're not going into how to manage all these right now because we just don't have that kind of time. Um, okay, next up, uh, uh, Angie. Yes. yes, all right, what do you see? You get, you get start however you want. 
That's right, several hypers. Uh huh. That's right. You see, there's some staining, and I would point out that it's along blood vessel walls. And then there's another kind of hyper in here. The biggest ones that you see are going to be this other category. Yeah. So those big blotchy things are. So do you know what the diagnosis is? By the way, if you don't, it's okay. If you know, once you what Ethan said earlier is true. When you once you've seen stuff for years and years or almost decades for me, like you see something, you already know what the diagnosis is. It makes your life so much easier. I re realized that when I was a medical student, by the way. People are like, oh, you need more confidence. I'm like, you can't have confidence until you're competent. And you can't be competent until you have some experience and you've seen stuff. So it's always best when you're in oral boards or OCAPs that you know what the diagnosis is. It makes the question so much easier. But of course, if you don't know the diagnosis, you have to kind of work through it in some systematic way until you kind of get there. So. What we see here, we see these bright areas that you pointed out. So we saw staining along some blood vessels. We see some leakage along some abnormal new blood vessels. And then we also see, do you see anything else you want to point out? Anything abnormally dark? Yeah, may, possibly. Well, this is an FA, so it's kind of hard to comment on choroid. Um, but th if you look out just peripheral to those bright areas, it's very dark. It's darker than normal. So we have, uh, it's not a blocking defect. It's, it's a hypofluorescence due to a filling defect because we don't have capillaries going out there. So this is a diabetic patient. And you can see those little rings off to the side in the temporal periphery. That's somebody else's laser from a long time ago. And maybe that's all they needed at that time. But clearly, they've progressed since then. Um, and this is the other eye. So you have similar things going on except worse because now there's a TRD. Inferior temporal, you can kind of see where it's dark, and it's, you really can't see as much detail. That's where the tractional retinal detachment is. A lot more neovascular complex there. And then again, patient also had some laser in the past. Again, I don't know who did it, um, but clearly they need more laser in this patient and needs surgery in the right eye as well. Okay. Sorry, can I ask a question? Of course. So you see where the TRD is? Yeah. Is that, is that fluid traction? Like, see how it kind of is a little... Um, a little round, like over on the temporal edge. You see how that line like that? Line that's yeah. That's the extent of the fluid. So that okay. So the fluid and okay. So that's the fluid. It's like it's kind of like jelly bean shaped or kidney yes, bean yeah, shaped. Yeah. Kidney, yeah. Okay. So this is another one of those where if you know the diagnosis, it makes your life easier. But all right, we've got Peter, right? And you're an intern or first year? Intern. Intern. All right. Well, <laughs> if you want to take a stab at it, go for it. So you could just describe what you see on either photo. Why don't you start with the color, actually? So we have, uh, I guess it's like the optos combined. This is pre-optos days, but yes. Oh. You could, but yeah, why we took it's actually top con with a bunch of photos kind of put together, yeah. right? Montage. Um, left eye focused, I guess, like macula opposite. Um, I guess you have like. <clears throat> Scars on the like temporally and yep. nasally. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And is that blood? Yeah, you got it. Lots of blood. So you've got you got a vitreous hemorrhage, kind of diffusely over, kind of blocking some of your view of the optic nerve, even of the macula. Certainly superior. There's some uh, diffuse VH. And then inferior, you see where the blood's really bright and kind of coagulate, not coagulated, but all together. We, I just call that a pre-retinal hemorrhage. And then it's kind of hard to see, but then you've got some abnormal blood vessels. We'll just look at the nasal periphery because that's where the FA is from. So abnormally bright, right? And it's pretty, it's leaked out a lot. We're at like three and a half minutes now. So we're kind of mid phase, venous phase. And, uh, and there's some abnormally dark stuff as well, kind of at the inferior, at the bottom of that photo where there's some non-perfusion. So this is a patient with peripheral neovascularization, and I don't have a differential listed here, but in this case, this patient has sickle cell, but there's a lot of other causes of peripheral NV. Gosh, I uh, put myself on the spot here. Eels disease, obviously PDR, diabetic retinopathy, ocular ischemic syndrome, Coach disease can even do it rarely. I mean, there's a, there's a whole lot, so fever, ROP. Okay, we're going to stop. All right, so mm -hmm. this is a 65-year-old that initially presented in March of 2022 just for NPDR. 
I saw her, saw the MPD. I was like, all right, we're good to go. And then she came back for an emergency visit like five months later, and she said she had loss of vision in her left eye. I don't remember how long. We'll say a few hours. Um, and now she also has, I'm going to give you some clues. This is for you, Vivian. Okay. She also has neovascularization of her iris in her left eye. That's new. I'd seen her before, so I knew it was new. And her pressure was up. It was like maybe 15 before. Now it's like 26, 27. Um, so these are our photos. Um, why don't you just look at the left, the patient's left eye on our right side and tell me what you see. No, that's great. So, and, and I will say this, kudos to you for looking at the optic nerve. It's hard on optos to comment on pallor sometimes because these optos images don't have high resolution. There may be some pallor, if there was, I missed it. But there's definitely some DVH, right? So, and it was a little bit worse than before, and she has this NVI. Does anybody know what I'm worried about yet? CRVO. Well, that's a great question. So CRVO, so CRVO almost always has dilated tortuous veins and she has some dilation, but not a lot of tortuosity. If you look at the left versus the right, you could definitely make an argument for a little bit of some uh, dilation. Um, her DBH for me, her dot blood hemorrhages are a little bit larger than I would like them to be. I don't ever want to see any. But then if I see some mid-peripheral, this, this is not the classic example by any means. If I see some mid-peripheral large dot blood hemorrhages in a diabetic, I'm sometimes thinking something else. Oh, my God. Right, like ocular ischemic syndrome. So let's see if I can get the next picture. So here we are, 18 seconds. The timing is correct, and we don't see much, right? This is almost like looking at autofluorescence. And then at 25 seconds, we're getting arterial filling, right? So we're delayed. We said by 12 seconds, we should be seeing this. So we're 12 seconds delayed. And then we're seeing leading edge die here, 25. So we're going to look at the next one, 27. We still don't see it fully going out. And then 32, it's going out a lot further. So it's delayed. And then, uh, let's see, can I go back? Uh, is it this one? Yeah. So we see laminar venous flow there. See that vein that has a stripe on it? There's probably some snake that has the same kind of stripe, but I don't know snakes. Um, so, so we're seeing delay. We're seeing delayed uh, arm to retina time, and I'm seeing delayed arteriovenous transit time. So I'm thinking in slightly dilated vessels. So I'm thinking ocular ischemic. So I sent her for carotids. And uh, let's see, do I have any notes on here? So you could see later on, I'm also want to point out, she has some leakage peripherally. You could see her veins are leaking a little bit. And then look at her other eye whenever I show it. Lots of diffuse leakage there, more prominent than the other eye. If she wasn't complaining about this eye, didn't have amaurosis in this eye. And then this is at three and a half minutes. Right eye's worse. And you can see the optic disc is brighter than it should be, too, uh, compared, especially compared to this one. So, uh, okay, do I, where's my little, okay, so she had, so she went for her um, carotid. She had right-sided uh, blockage, like 60 to 79%, and the left side only had 1 to 39%. And I will say, I've seen a lot of people for carotids that have stuff like this, and oftentimes comes back pretty underwhelming. She did end up going on to have a carotid endarterectomy on her right side about six months later. I think it's something had worsened. Um, and I just saw her last week. She's doing okay. So basically for ocular ischemic, the, the book doesn't give a lot of FA sort of criteria, but it does list this one for OIS. 60% have a delayed choroidal filling or arm to retina time. And then 95% have a prolonged AV transit time. And a lot of them will have prominent vascular staining. She has some staining, she has more leakage. Um, okay, so here's our next one. All right, Christian's up. Uh, do you know what kind of picture the picture uh, the color picture is? If you know what kind of picture that is, that gives you a big clue. These are low contrast, kind of wide angle. They were our wide angle ones before Optus came out. This is a, like a ret cam photo, and so ret cam photos we only do in kiddos under you know exams under anesthesia or in the NICU. So when you see this kind of a washed out, non-high contrast image, you've got to be thinking kid. 
And so um, I'll, that's, that's the first clue. And then tell me what you see in there. What, does anything look abnormal to you? It's not a great image, but it's, yeah. that's what you get with RET cam. So the blood vessels um, superiorly, there's some, I don't know, weird crossing over going up there, some bright spots around it. That's the first thing I found. And then the, down in the um, inferotemporal. Yep, inferior temporal. Um, there's a, that big white spot with like Wonderful. this. And so the, the first thing you mentioned is probably just a reflex from the camera. Um, but, the, but the second thing you mentioned is definitely where we're, our attention is dragged to or pointed to. And then you can see on the FA, we see some abnormally bright stuff, like maybe a microaneurysm or two. We see some abnormally dark stuff. So that would be blocked fluorescence. So hypofluorescence, due, not due to blocking, sorry, due to a filling defect. This is a patient with Coates disease. And Oh, here we go. FA, peripheral telangiectasia is light bulb aneurysms. Okay. Uh, we don't have a whole, whole lot of time. I don't think we'll get to ICGA, but definitely we'll get to autofluorosis. This is, a, this is somebody that one of you might have seen a, a month and a half ago, because occasionally I have to send people to the ER. Well, I think I saw this thing. All right, good. Well, don't give it away. <laughs> All right, so, so this lady comes in. This is a good story, and this is one that's worth remembering. A 71-year-old female who comes in. She's, I forgot which, who referred her. Uh, but anyway, she came in to see me, and she said, oh, she came in with the chief complaint of some flashes of light. And Ethan mentioned this earlier, flat, not all flashes of light are the same. I will immediately try to bifurcate them into, is this a, P, a, a vitreous separation flash of light or not? I mean, that's for me, I mean, that's a retina specialist approach. Is it, is it a retinal problem or is it not my problem, basically? <laughs> but so, and there are some obviously photopsies that are retinal problems, but they're usually uveitis problems too. So, so this lady, it was not a, I have a crescent of light. She was just kind of like, it just feels like everything's a little bit too bright in my right eye. And I'm like, that's kind of strange. And, and so I, I looked at her eye, and, and I'll, um, I'll have Camilla point out what's wrong in this picture. And then I said, so tell me about this brightness. You know, is that what brought you? She's like, yeah, it's really bothering me. She goes, it's bothering me so much I stopped driving. And when she said that, I was like, okay, something's wrong. Texans don't give up driving <laughs> unless there's a real problem, right? You can't get around. It's not like we live in, you know, Philly or you just walk everywhere in New York. Oh, I gave it away. All right, so what do you see in that picture that I just highlighted and unhighlighted? So as you say, first the media looks pretty clear. Yep. And then, um, and then I'll give you the blood vessels. Is that what we call like a tumor? Do they look dense? And I was wondering if there's some, we're looking at still like embolism. These look more like not bright, like I've seen with embolism, but they are at like the bifurcation right over here. Yeah, so. The yeah, so, so a couple of vessels you could argue are a little attenuated in the nasal periphery. Uh, you could argue that along the um, arcades, they might actually be a little bit more tortuous, but I like to, actually, if I'm really concerned about vascular issues with tortuosity and caliber, I like to look at an autofluorescence, and I like to look at both eyes side by side, assuming the other eye is not involved. And that, that con high contrast really gives me a lot of insight. Is there tortuosity or not? So I, what I circled here is basically the only finding I could see when I looked in her eye. I saw a cotton wool spot. And in the book, it makes a really big deal. Gary Brown has, it's the same table that was there 15 years ago when I was in, when I, I mean, like I think I started residency 15 years ago this week, so, or this month. There's a table there that's like, basically says, never let a patient with a cotton wool spot leave your office without a reason for it. And I think the reason is, the, there's, I think there's a backstory. What I heard was, is that there was like a patient who had a cotton wool spot and then they, um, they, got, they got just a regular workup done and it turns out they had leukemia. And, th and this is at Wills, this is a long time ago and maybe it was one of, one of my um, partners when he was there. And I don't know if that was the genesis of the table, but in the table it does list leukemia as a possibility. This is not a leukemia case. Um, but there are reasons for a cotton wool spot. There's not, I mean, you shouldn't just say, oh, there's a cotton wool spot. Unless they're diabetic, then yeah, have all the cotton wool spots you want. But this patient had a cotton wool spot. I don't think she's diabetic and I said, this is, a, this is a good example of when Daryl Baskin gets an FA, because I don't get them very often, but in this case, I was like, oh, we're definitely getting an FA. So we got an FA, and all right, you're still on. Uh, what do we see in this one? Your 18 seconds in has the pen control check in mark. Should be seen more. Should be seen more. That's right. And so we see leading edge of Dianan artery. So by the next picture, which is usually two to three seconds later, the artery should be fully filled, and they're not. So now we have A, a delayed arm to retina time. B, we've got other stuff going on. So I'll keep going. I'll stop here. Actually, let's stop here. What else do you notice about this? Actually, an interesting linear pattern of hypofluorescence. 
That's right. So we see hypofluorescence, and is it due to blocking or due to a filling defect? So, mm, between the two, and the color image that we saw, I didn't see anything that was causing That's a good, yeah, that's a great point. Blocking, you can almost always solve the question is if you see the color, do you actually see something blocking? Right. It's going to be filling. And then what, so that's abnormally dark. You're right. I think I've got this highlighted coming up eventually. Here we go. Uh, so we see, saw a single cotton wool spot. This is in the choroid. We have a lack of filling, right? So we've delayed and patchy choroidal filling. You can actually have some patchy choroidal filling initially, but it needs to be gone by the time the arteries are filling up. So if you look, oh, there's some lobular filling. If it's gone in two seconds, I wouldn't worry about it. So we see that. We see a prolonged arterial phase or AV phase. And then we see mild dilation, tortuosity. It's real mild. I can only call it when I had both side by side. If I just looked at this, I wouldn't have been able to call it. And then we see a little bit of optic nerve staining. And I do wonder if maybe she had something going on in optic nerve that I missed. Um, and so they've got a couple more that says 43 seconds, 46, 60, other eye. Looks pretty good. A few microaneurysms peripherally. Um, and then here we see more optic disc edema. We see a little bit of retinal venular uh, staining or leakage, or both actually. Okay, so, so I came back to her and I said, all right, now I'm concerned about something else. And I won't ask anybody what it is. If you, anybody want to say what you think I'm thinking at this point? GCA. Right. So then I'm like, okay, I go through my whole GCA thing. And I don't ever say, do you, I try to ask in an indirect way. So I'll say, do you have any trouble standing up? That's my proximal muscle weakness proxy. And they're like, nope. If you say, does this muscle, is this muscle tired? Oh yeah, this muscle's tired. And then they give you the, <laughs> now, well, it was last week, you know, you got to get to the point. And so then I said, any trouble combing your hair, if they have hair, and then that gives me the proximal muscle, but also is there any scalp tenderness? And eventually I'll just say, does it hurt to touch? So she did not have scalp tenderness. But she had a headache. She had neck pain for like a couple months. It got an MRI. She had a headache every morning, but then she had major jaw claudication. And she had, I think, did she say she had weight loss? Brandon, is this the lady you saw? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't remember if she's, I don't know if I specifically asked if weight loss. Yeah, she, she, she didn't weight, weight loss. But yeah, and so I was like, all right, lady, you're going to the ER. I'm sorry to, you know, take away 24 hours of your life. But, <laughs> but you know, she came back. She got on IV steroids. She got a TA biopsy. It was positive, right? And, um, and she's doing a lot better. Her symptoms were gone. She wanted to get another FA, and now for this lecture, I wish I had agreed to it. <laughs> And got an ICGA, but I didn't. So, happy yeah. ending, hopefully. She came with the FA pictures and everything. It was super helpful. So I was like, oh, oh. Yeah. And I was oh good, like, good. <laughs> good. Is, uh, makes my job easier. I was like, That's, yeah. I yeah. agree. <laughs> yeah. I hate sending stuff to you guys because I don't want to unload things, but there's certain patients I just can't yeah, sure. manage in my office. I could have started on steroids. I had another lady I just sent over. I don't know if she actually came. Did a one legged lady come in recently? You're probably not always on. Yeah. Yes, all right. <laughs> Real cantankerous from the Hill Country. Yep, yeah, I made her promise she's gonna come in. I could tell she wasn't gonna go that same day. But anyway, you could tell me later. I know I, I've I've known her for six years. So my patient population, you know, they a lot of my regular patients will get GCA, which is kind of weird. So you don't want to miss that. If some you come in and they've got something to say, it's important to say, have things been the same? Are you doing okay? And not. If any of you become retina doctors, don't make the mistake of just always coming in and giving a shot, not talking to the patient, right? I mean, I could talk for hours about ways to be a better or worse retina specialist, but I mean, one of the key things is really know your patients, see what's going on. Um, all right, this is a good case. I think we have time for this. Um, Dr. Sorry, real quick question. For her, was it just like, so the cotton wool spot alone, right? Like, I know it's on, I think GCA is on a different. It is, part, yeah. It's not the first thing that. It, and about. it shouldn't be. So right. was the cotton wool spot alone thing that you were like, I'm going to get the FA? Like, what made you, would you do that for any? No. So it honestly, the, the reason I got the FA was primarily because she said that it was too bright to drive. I mean, nobody says that. I thought there's something real organic going on here. And what you, you never want to just dismiss somebody's symptoms, yeah. you know, dry. I probably called way too many things dry eye, but I don't want to call, you know, I don't want to dismiss this. So for me, it was, there's no good reason for cotton wool spot. She has, this brightness is too, the brightness thing is not classic. Like nothing in the book is going to say, oh, they're real photosensitive or something like that or photophobic. I mean, maybe it's in there somewhere, but that's not something I learned. You just, as you get older, you kind of get a sense of what 
what's normal, what's not normal. When somebody just quits driving, there's something there. I had a really interesting case. It's not in here at all. Uh, I think I have his FA, but I don't want to spoil it for you because eventually I'll show it to you. But it was a, a doctor at, um, at who was basically high administrative level in, uh, in Texas at the hospital. And he was just having trouble driving as well. He's having trouble reading up close and we couldn't figure it out for forever. And I was like, there's something here. We did genetics, we did ERG. He had some changes on his OCT, they were real mild, his outer retina. I never solved it. And then he called me one day, he saw shots even. He goes, I figured it out. I was like, really? Tell me. <laughs> He's like, I figured it out and I wanna come back and we wanna see if the pictures are better. Sure enough, he came back because his ellipsoid zone had been restored. He, he told me, he's like, I was having three hard drinks every night. And he said, I thought maybe that was affecting my vision. And it turns out he was right. He probably, he did have some ge weird genetic uh, variations that were encoded for like some, you know, possible retinitis pigmentosa kind of stuff, but nothing, or no, is, sorry, speaking on contem uh, extemporaneously on this guy's not gonna help, but I think he had like a cone or cone rod. He had something really mild, he was heterozygous. It just didn't, didn't line up. But I think he probably had a predisposition genetically that made him, you know, with alcohol, with whatever kind of stresses that put on his photoreceptors was too much. I've never had a case like that. But it's a, it's, I bring it up because sometimes things just don't fit and then you have to go deeper. And I think for this patient, I don't know if I could say across the board, if you see a cotton wool spot and you can't explain it, do an FA. But, but maybe you should think about, you know, making sure that you, you because the cotton wool spot's going to disappear. You don't have to worry about that. That's eventually going to go away unless there's some other ongoing thing. But you know, you can have a cotton wool spot in early uh, SLE. I mean, you could have it in a lot of different diseases that are pretty dangerous. So I would try to dig deeper. I mean, this is the best time to dig deeper. When you're in private practice, people neglect so much. You, I mean, you guys see it in the ER, right? These people that come in, they're like, oh, my doctor's been saying it's fine for forever. So please be thorough now because you're not gonna be more thorough later. And if, if you have a cotton wool spot and you can't figure it out, I don't think there's anything wrong with getting an FA. Um, especially because we're dealing with retinal vascular issue that led to that cotton wool spot. Did you ask the question? So did you, once you got the FA back, is that That's when I asked. asked yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. If she had come in saying, I got jaw glottication, yeah. I lost weight, I'd been like, oh yeah, <laughs> I know what you got. <laughs> it really was, and it's like normally people tell you everything that's going on, but you know, she just thought you're an eye doctor, I'm just going to yeah. tell you about my eyes. Yeah. So you saw the cotton wool spot, like, okay, that is weird, so I'll get the FA. It's not like you saw the No, honestly, like, okay, let me honestly, I was worried about her giving up her driving. And I was like, there's something real here. All I saw was a cotton wool spot. This doesn't explain the brightness issue giving up driving. So I'm going to keep on going with an FA. It, again, I, I have a higher threshold for ordering FAs. I wish I didn't. It's probably, again, because of my grandmother. My partners would got an FA, you know, the moment that she walked in the door, which is, there's, I'm, not, I'm not castigating them. There's nothing wrong with that. But for me, I always worry about that one little old lady who's going to go to the ICU. And gosh, that's never happened to me. And I don't know anybody else it's happened to. But, um, but yeah, so, so yes, that, that more or less, if I'm remembering exactly my thought process, I, I'm pretty certain I've seen cotton wool spots and not gotten FAs. If, but usually I'll say, you know, it looks like a, a small branch retinal vein occlusion. If I see something on the OCT that corroborates it, I don't know if I've ever let somebody with a cotton wool spot leave my clinic without some explanation. Mm -hmm. Or if they leave my clinic, they're going to get a workup, at the very least like a CBC or something like that. So I think, do we have time to do one more or do you guys have to go? Okay, this is, this is a good one. Um, okay, I, who's up next? Oh, yes. Tell me your name again. Kelly. Kelly. All right. Kelly. Uh, so this is not super fair. So I will give you a little bit of information. It's like a 40 something year old lady, uh, vision loss for a couple weeks, uh, headache, uh, some light sensitivity. And I'm going to show you a couple of her FAs. There's nothing really to comment on here. There's a little bit, but it's not fair. So now we're a minute in. This is not a timing issue, by the way. So we're seeing, would you say anything abnormally bright or abnormally dark at this point? Um, I would say like there's an overall, like it almost looks kind of inverted, like the vessel should be brighter and the choroid should be darker. That's right, so the, you, what you're saying is the choroid's not as dark as it normally is, right? So it's a little bit brighter. You, or there's something bright under the retinal blood vessels, let's just say that. So it's a little bit hyperfluorescent, and it's at the level that's somewhere beneath the blood vessels. And maybe it's the choroid. Same thing here, right? And 
changed a little bit. All right, so this fits into a category. So anybody, there's, a diagnos, there's a differential diagnosis for what this is. So we see multiple pinpoint areas that are hyperfluorescent on an FA. We, I call that the starry sky you know, kind of picture. So we've got one of those starry sky photo, you know, Van Gogh coming up. So there's a whole differential diagnosis for this. It's a, not a bad one to know. I only have it probably half to three quarter memorized. But um, there's a few things on this list. Anybody want to name one? Has anybody ever heard this before, Star Sky? It's fine if you haven't. Yeah, okay, it's fine. So <laughs> the first case this morning from Grand Rounds, there's a question about a disease. Not sticklers, but the patient with sticklers might have another disease. Sympathetic ophthalmia. So sy sympathetic ophthalmia. Yeah, you're right. Wagner's on differential for sticklers. But no, no, no. So, so things that leak from the choroid. So you could, basically what we're seeing these pinpoint dots is there's some kind of choroidal issue going on, and it's poked through the RPE in multiple different perforations. And so we're seeing dye coming up from below. And so we're seeing that here. And let's see, is it going to show up? OK, so lupus is one. Oh, gosh, I'm going to have to hit a bunch of times to get through these. Sympathetic, so uvula effusion. Central serous is possible. Usually you just get one, but you can have multifocal central serous. Hypotony can do this. Hypotony gives you a lot of clues just on the OCT. The OCT is thick and the upper portion is usually lots of little kind of ridges and things like that. Upper portion of the RPE, I should say. Posterior scleritis can do this. VKH can do this. MCP can do this. And then the mnemonic is this LSU cheerleaders hate playing volleyball on Mondays. <laughs> I, I mean, some mnemonics are helpful and some aren't. I mean, this is just not one you're gonna use. <laughs> Unless you're taking a test, and no, I mean, unless you're like an oral boards, I can't imagine you needing this. Because if you see this, then you're just going to go, I'm going to go look up what this starry sky differential is. But it's important to know starry sky is a real thing. This patient has one of those, and then I wouldn't expect you to know which one. So we're going to keep on going. So this is, does anybody know what kind of image this is, by the way? This is one of those six that I put up. This isn't the actual image. This is a type of one of those six that I first put up. So is this an FA? No. How do we know it's not an FA? The blood, blood vessels are dark, right? And then, uh, so is this an autofluorescence? Blood vessels are dark in autofluorescence, right? It's not autofluorescence, although the blood vessels are dark in that because the optic nerve is bright. The optic nerve is dark in autofluorescence as well. Is it ICGA? No, because ICGA, the optic nerve is dark. Okay, so I'm just telling you all the things it's not. It's a red free, and the reason I'm bringing that up is it, all, all these different imaging modalities have certain advantages and disadvantages. Red free is great for, um, well, I don't use red free very much anymore, but it's really good for looking at blood vessels. It's, it, it's showing striae here. Do you see those striae? It's really highlighting the striae more so than the color will. So we're going to go on to the next one. This is the left eye. So this is a bilateral process. She was 2200 in her right eye, like count fingers at one foot in her left. And um, this is her OCT. It's been really hard for me to hold back on the OCTs. This is before I got spectralis. This is in my fellowship. We, we had a different uh, modality called RT View. Do you guys have any of those? Thank goodness. I don't really like them. <laughs> um, but here's what I want you to notice. Bottom left corner is probably the easiest OCT to see. You have a ton of subretinal fluid, so hyperreflective space underneath the retina, and you have a really thick choroid. And I will tell you, I haven't seen a ton of VKH, but it seems like most of them, when they're acute, have this real lumpy, bumpy, thick choroid with tons of subretinal fluid. This is not pathognomonic, but it's really close. When you see this, you've got to have VKH on your differential. And then, oh yeah, you can see the striae on her color. So the striae also are not pathognomonic, but darn close. Um, oh, here's our vision. Okay, so yeah, KP, AC reaction, vitreous. Vitreous is not so bad that it, it made our photos uh, quality bad. Okay, this is our last couple of slides. So. I actually went through the book and, and wrote down the names of every single FA picture based on the diagnosis. So we covered a lot of these, but not all of them. There are a lot of things that you can get an FA on. You don't need an FA for most of these to make the diagnosis or to manage them. This is for, that was from the retina book. The uveitis book has fewer. And I guess we're not going to get to ICG, so we won't talk about that just yet. So. Um, we will stop there. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Maybe a silly question. No, I love silly. Can you go back to the last um, episode? The very last. That one. Yeah, that one. 
right there in the fovea. I see that on fundus photos a lot. What is that? That's probably just foveal light reflex. Um, it, and, and yeah, I don't have a lot of color photos on here, but you're talking about that kind of yellowish yeah, ring. Yeah, yeah. and she's got an ab... Yeah, it's not always there. You'll see it more often in younger kids. The ILM is a bit more reflective, and it, and the I think it's actually the reflection is a lot to do with the vitreo retinal interface creating that reflectivity, that mirror-like quality, and it's almost like a specialized mirror that focuses light into the center. So oftentimes it's just a dot, but in this case it's funny shaped, and a lot of my patients don't have it at all. Once you get older, you don't see it as often. I'm not, but yeah, that one is a little bit different, and there might be something more going on with her. If we. If I had better OCT quality, we might see maybe there's like a little, there's, have you ever heard of a bacillary detachment? It's almost like where there's a little separation of the uh, photoreceptor outer segments from each other and you get like fluid pocket in there. She probably doesn't have that, but may, something like that could also maybe give a similar appearance. You could also say maybe this is an outer macular hole or something like that, but outer macular holes usually look darker too. Um, thank you for that question. Yeah. She did well, by the way. She got on like 60 or 80 milligrams of uh, PO pred, and then I think she came back to like 2040, 20, yeah, 2040 uh, on the right, and then 2050 on the left. Pinhole, you know, it's like, that's a retina doctor's best friend, the <laughs> pinhole acuity. <laughs> All right, so we'll finish. I'll push stop on the recording.